Welcome everyone to the first meeting in November 2020 of the Rotary Club of Des Moines. This is week number 15 here in person at Wakanda. I will not be wearing my mask while at the podium so you can hear me more clearly and I'm safely distanced from all of you. We do ask that those here keep your masks on when not eating or drinking or speaking from the podium. Last week, Colleen Rogers' messenger from the community service asked for our help. The goal is to help 200 families with fairway gift cards of $40 each. We'll mention that these cards are limited to food purchases only. They do not allow purchase of tobacco or alcohol. These will be going to students at Edmonds Elementary. This is a diverse school with over 92% minority students, and nearly half of the 300 students are English language learners. The school is 100% free and reduced lunch. Thanks to you, thanks to you, to those of you who have uh, donated already. We're at 122 families that are being helped, so we're well short of our current goal of 200 families. There's information at your table with a sign-up sheet, or you can uh, call or, or email Kitty to donate as well. We can bill you for your donation. Please note the deadline for this is coming quickly. It's next Monday, November 9th. So please donate, and I'll go ahead and help out again. I'll do uh, two more, Kitty, if you want to put me down for that. And Chris Anderson is holding up his fingers as well for two. So thank you there, Chris. Thank you. Also, we need more people to sign up for a moment of inspiration. We ask for volunteers each, a volunteer each week, and this is the only duty we need to fulfill. Please sign up online or in the lobby. Maybe this will help. Some sad news, I will not be here the next two weeks for the Rotary meetings. Oh, come on, no clapping. So in the next two weeks, you don't even have to be in the same room with me. Maybe that's a motivation for somebody to step up. Yeah, Skeet's going to sign up for both of them now. He said he did sign up for one. All right. I've got some question for you. How many of you here know Tom, who Tom Brady is? How about LeBron James? Taylor Swift? Now, if one of them were to walk into the room right now, many of you would probably want their autograph or a selfie taken with them. Because for some of these people, they're your heroes. Now, if a 36-year-old man named Thomas Paine walked in here, how many of you would be honored to meet him? Would you even know who he is or why it would be an honor to meet this man? Well, I'll tell you. First Sergeant Thomas Paine, a member of the U.S. Army's elite Delta Force, prioritized a mission after it was discovered that new graves had been dug at a prison compound where 70 people were being held hostage by the Islamic State. On October 22, 2015, he engaged the enemy multiple times. <clears throat> he entered and retreated several times from a burning building due to smoke, heat, and heavy enemy fire, even though the building was collapsing, until finally breaching a door to allow 30 hostages to escape certain death. Sergeant Payne was the last to leave the building after re-entering twice more to make sure all hostages were out. He and the team then formed a protective barrier as the hostages ran to evacuation helicopters. For his heroism, 
now Sergeant Major Thomas Payne, was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. For his uncommon valor, he was not getting millions of dollars for doing commercials, for credit cards, or soda pop. He is not having crowds of people wanting his autograph or a photo. He volunteered to serve his country and ex expected no fanfare for it. Since I'll be not, I will not be here for next week's meeting, I wanted to make sure that Veterans Day, which is next Wednesday, November 11th, is not forgotten. In November of 2002, I was in London, England, and learned they do not have a Veterans Day there. Instead, they have Veterans Week. I wish we had the same here. Now, there are several of my heroes here today and watching the live stream. If you have served in the military, will you please stand so we can recognize and give you the recognition and respect you deserve. And for, the, for those of you veterans not present here today, we also thank you for your service as well. And now, I'd like to ask Tim Lillowitz to introduce today's keynote speaker. I got all excited. Thank you. Now we'll have John Tone up. of Allegiance, and then the four-way test. Thank you. I, after that very nice inspiration about the veterans, uh, it doesn't quite measure up, but uh, I want to congratulate David Oman for a good job but on, on TV as our local TV star on the election campaign. Nice going, David, on that. Um, I imagine we all voted this week. It was a historical event for the women in the room, though. It, uh, 2020 marks the 100th anniversary of the women's right to vote. In 1987, our club opened membership to women. There were 10 women who joined in that year. Elaine Estes, I don't see her here. She usually comes, but she was part of that class. Um, now we have 33 years later, a third of all women in Rotary Club International are women. 27% are club presidents. So when we're thinking of the campaign over the last many months, may the Lord bless the results of this week's elections and hope that she will be with us to unite and move forward. Thank you. Please, the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The four-way test, truth, is it fair to all concerned, will it be beneficial for membership, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Yes, wave at everyone. Hopefully we're not too far off where we can shake each other's hands instead of wave. All right. Now I can ask Tim to come up to introduce our speaker. I think everyone knows the drill. If you have a question, please go to the microphone, which Katie will scrub thoroughly between each speaker, and uh, state your name so those out uh, watching on live stream can uh, know who you're, uh, who you, who is asking the question, and as well, uh, hopefully see you on the screen. Tim. Thank you, President Doug. Uh, I have the uh, privilege this afternoon to introduce Peter Stevenson. Um, Peter is the executive director 
of the Civic Music Association. Prior to joining the CMA in 2014, Peter was the Director of Development at the Des Moines Symphony, where he helped raise uh, $10 million for the symphony's endowment. A graduate of both Iowa State University with a BA in Art and Design and the University of Iowa with an MA in Art History, Peter is a former Fulbright Scholar who has used his knowledge of art and culture to develop exhibitions and create interpretive programs at many leading institutions across the country, including the Field Museum in Chicago, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. Additionally, at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, he managed adult public programs, including collaborative projects involving the San Francisco Symphony and the San Francisco Opera. During his presentation today, Peter will introduce the Civic Music Association to all of us, share his thoughts on the Central Iowa music environment, and responding to the challenges presented by the coronavirus pandemic. The title of his talk this afternoon is, It Was the Best of Times. So please join me in welcoming Peter. Thank you, Tim, for that nice introduction, and thank you to Kyle for inviting me, uh, Kyle McCormick. Uh, and thanks to all of you here at Wakanda, or those of you who are online, for spending 20 minutes of your time and giving your attention to my presentation. I, I can make uh, no promise in terms of the appeal and interest that you might have in my presentation, but I can promise one thing, I'll make no mention of the election. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Next slide, please. So. Um, the agenda of my talk, as, uh, as Tim mentioned, is to introduce CMA, Civic Music Association, to you, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, what is happening and what has happened in recent years in terms of the music ecosystem in our community, which is pretty exciting, uh, uh, pri especially prior to the pandemic. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the pivot th that we undertook to respond to COVID-19 and the, the way that the industry is having to respond, and I'll finish by um, a few thoughts on how we might survive this together. Next slide. So Civic Music Association, CMA, is our preferred acronym for that for our organization. We've been around since 1925. We're a 95-year-old organization. We are a presenter of concerts, mostly jazz and chamber music. Um, we uh, operate uh, by principles that things we believe in, and these are things that we hold strongly, but we can't prove, right? So the first thing is that we believe that great music that we present has intrinsic value that creative expression in all of its forms is essential to bring meaning to our lives. Imagine your life without music or the arts or any kind of creative experience that you have. And we also believe that jazz and chamber music are uh, significant and relevant art forms for today. They are the two smallest uh, niche markets in terms of the number of uh, albums sold and the audience that attends those concerts, but they still are vibrant and lots of good things happening. We're, pl we're pleased to present it in central Iowa. Next slide. Uh, but we also know things. These are things that we can quantify. Uh, live music brings people together. Um, it, it is an opportunity for the community to come together and experience something together. And those opportunities are more important than ever. I think we all would agree. Um, we can also say that music education, and we, I'll talk a little bit about how we uh, support and are involved in music education in our community. But um, we know, because we can measure it, that it music education enhances student achievement. Um, and improves their performance and has other uh, ancillary benefits. And we also can say that a vibrant art scene, art scene that includes music is an economic driver, and I'm so happy to be living in a community that gets that um, from the top down, from the partnership and our, our city council and the corporations and the individuals who support the arts in Des Moines. It seems like there's a common uh, consensus that that's what it is all about, is quality experiences that drive it, economic success in our community. Next slide. So those are the things we believe and the things that we know, and well, what do we do to, to, to manifest that? Next slide, please. Um, CMA Presents is our main concert activity. We do uh, about seven concerts a year, starting in September through October. We are nomadic. We don't own a venue. We present in various venues from Hoyt Sherman Place to uh, the Drake Campus, the Sheslow Auditorium. Uh, we've presented at the Phyllis Stapleton Center at Valley. 
uh, over the years. Um, and um, we uh, were founded, I'm pleased to say, by three women in 1925, uh, Elsa Newman, Gertrude Schloss, and Betty Coles, who were great fans of classical music and other art um, forms of music. They would travel to go see it. And they'd come back to Des Moines, and, and it wasn't happening here. And so they said, this, this needs to happen. Des Moines deserves to have opportunities for hearing great music. And um, I, I, I like to think of these women, if they were alive today in their 20s or 30s, um, uh, really embracing the Des Moines Hell Yes motto. I, really, I mean, they're really civic-minded people, and it was very common in the 20s, right? The very explosion of, of, of this kinds of activity. Um, but they probably wouldn't wear Des Moines Hell Yes t-shirts, right? They, they probably would wear socks, something discreet. But they would believe in the message. Um, they, they aimed high from the beginning in the first decades of this organization's history. If you look at our season history on our website, civicmusic.org, it's amazing. Um, the, I've got a couple of names and a couple of photos on the screen here of Sergei Rachmaninoff, who you may be familiar with if you are a fan of classical music. One of the most important 20th century composers and pianists was here in 1934. Um, Marian Anderson, the great soprano. She's, that picture is her standing in front of, I believe, the Lincoln Memorial in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, she was brought to Des Moines to sing for us. Uh, before there was the Des Moines Symphony, we brought the Chicago Symphony. Um, before there was the Des Moines Metro Opera, we would bring opera to Des Moines. Um, next slide, please. Um, over the course of the last 75 years, we've, had, we've presented about 529 concerts. Um, and the, when Marcellus, well, young, a young Wynton Marcellus came to Des Moines through, the, through Civic Music Association. A young Joshua Bell, one of the greatest violinists today, came to Des Moines through this organization. So we, um, we, we aim to, we're the only organization like uh, ours that brings national and international touring artists, mostly jazz, mostly chamber, to Des Moines, and we're proud to keep doing it. So that's the, that's the most kind of visible public uh, aspect of our work. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the other thing that you may be familiar, familiar with is we manage what's called the Bell and Quartet. Next slide. This is a, a professional string quartet comprised of Des Moines Symphony musicians um, who perform uh, free summertime concerts downtown. They have for the past 21, 21 seasons. Uh, the, the quartet is named after David Bellin, a prominent attorney in Des Moines who was an amateur violinist and a believer in classical music and a um, member of the Warren Commission, if you may, maybe you may know that. Um, but uh, his family, after he died in 1999, established the, uh, a fund that has, for the past 21 seasons, supported the work of the quartet. So in addition to these public concerts, they also um, perform in schools and retirement centers, and do, we do collaborative projects with the Des Moines Opera and the ballet and things like that. Um, but that's an important part of what we bring to Des Moines on, on a regular basis, and it's, it's free thanks to the family, the, uh, the Bellin family. Uh, next slide. Um, I mentioned music education. We, uh, we, we call what we, we have a moniker for what, what we do in terms of music education. It's called CMA Studio. Next slide. Uh, these are education programs that are offered free to kids, K through 12 and then also college, where we give music students mostly, whether they're elementary kids that are being handed their first string instrument or they're uh, in the jazz program at Drake and they're, you know, they're, in, they're trying to push the envelope and maybe get a degree in performance, right? We give a range of kind of experiences for these kids to have up close and personal interactions with professional musicians and it's inspiring uh, for the young people that get a chance to just to experience that. About 2,000 students a year uh, come through our programs. Some of the programs we do are rather small and intimate like master classes, those are usually pretty small. Sometimes we do, last fall we did one with 500 students at Hoyt Sherman Place and they're all bussed in and um, that, so there's a, a range of, of uh, kinds of programs that we do. Um, next slide. Um, I, I won't ask you to try to read this. I'm going to suggest that there are, th there are um, ways that music education, encouraging music education to happen for kids has real benefits and we can measure them. So we see our, our CMA studio programs as supporting what's going on in the schools, encouraging kids who have, been, uh, have had their first maybe experience with music, get, get them excited about it. And it, stick with it, right? That's the that's impor most important thing is to stick with it, no matter how good you are, right? Uh, for many kids, music can be what keeps them in school, um, period. I know my son, my older son, uh, he participated in the uh, Bridges to Harmony Gospel Choir at Roosevelt. If not for that, he may not have graduated. It really is uh, something that can help kids stick with it. 
Um, and in, in addition to copious anecdotal evidence, like my story of my son about the importance of music education, we have objective measures. Um, music education improves cognitive development. Uh, brain structure is improved. Uh, better memory and retention is, is seen. Vocabulary goes up. English and math scores go, are raised by approximately 20% between those kids who don't have music education opportunities and those that do. Um, not mentioned on this slide are the kind of the soft things about it. Um, improved social skills. Um, leadership skills come out of this experience that kids have in music education. The ability to cooperate as a member of a team and cooperating with one another doesn't matter if you have differences is so important, right, today. So that's a, that's a bit about CMA and what we do and why. Um, now, of course, CMA is one, but one of many organizations in central Iowa dedicated to music. CMA is part of a, a music ecosystem and of uh, performing arts organizations, venues in central Iowa, as well as a national system of artists, presenters, and managers. But the music e ecosystem involves more than these obvious players. If you invest in your music ecosystem, the rest of the community benefits. A healthy live music economy supports jobs across a variety of sectors, from hospitality to tech, logistics to food and beverage. Musicians make our community a better place to live, as I've mentioned. And I'm, as I mentioned before, Des Moines seems to know this, at least if you measure our enthusiasm by the number of new and improved venues that have come online in the last several years. Let's for a moment transport ourselves, if, we, if you might, back to November, December of 2019, maybe even January, before we uh, realized this, the pickle we were in. And um, if we do that, we can take a look around, and we see some pretty amazing things happening that reflect significant inv investments by uh, corporations, individuals, and in, in city, uh, city government to uh, support continued significant growth in the music ecosystem. Next slide. Um, the, pro probably one of the most obvious examples of this is the Lauritsen Amphitheater uh, in Waterworks Park. It opened uh, summer of 2019. It has two lawns. Uh, that, what you're seeing there on the left is the, 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 the canopy on the sta over the stage, but if you've if, the North Lawn uh, is, holds about 25,000 people. The South Lawn is smaller, holds about 2,000. The Bell and Quartet actually last that summer had some concerts where we put our stage and our audience right on the, uh, our, our quartet and the audience right on stage. Uh, it's a beautiful, uh, an attractive way to, for people to experience music. Next slide, please. Um, another amphitheater that's um, just recently opened, actually, they, in September had a grand opening amid all this, was the Jamie Hurd Amphitheater uh, in uh, West Des Moines. It's right along, uh, along with, it's behind City Hall uh, in West Des Moines. Um, it's about a $2.4 $2 million project. There's a 1,500-square-foot stage that holds up to 50 musicians. The lawn can hold about 2,000. Um, it, 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 the, the, the lawn is graded naturally in a way that is just perfect for outdoor uh, activity. Next slide. Uh, a third uh, amphitheater, this one is yet, not yet done. It's close. I, I go by it on my bike quite frequently. Is the Riviera Stage at, R at Riverview Park, which is nearing completion, as I mentioned. It's a $4 million project. It's named for the Riviera Ballroom at the Riverview Muse Amusement Park, which some of you may recall it used to be uh, in that part of Des Moines until 1978 um, when it closed. <clears throat> the original Riviera Ballroom uh, burned down in 1980. Uh, this is in, uh, in memory of that space, which was so important to Des Moines. The stage is about 50 feet long and has a lawn that holds 6,000, so it's a big space. Um, if you've seen the facility at all, you can tell that it's got a fun roller coaster theme. And that'll be reflected, I guess, in the, the there's going to be some places for children to play in, in that area as well that will all be kind of roller coaster themed. Next slide. Um, further down the road, and this is a huge undertaking that you may, you may be familiar with, this is the quarter in Waukee, the quarter entertainment district. Um, it'll be no, located north of I-80 and near Grand Prairie Parkway in that area of, of Waukee. The latest plans, which I um, learned about recently, is that it's a, it's a $103 million project on 28 acres with 18 buildings, including a 60,000 square foot indoor outdoor concert venue, which is what you see on the screen. Uh, that capacity is about 8,000 people. Um, completion date for the whole project is 2025. I'm not sure what order these buildings will come online, but this one will sometime in the, near, in the next four to five years. So those are the, the, the kind of a big uh, outdoor, mostly uh, some indoor outdoor uh, facilities un that are underway or just recently opened. Another thing is, next slide please, is the, the attention given to a couple of existing facilities that uh, are, are very interesting, and one is Hoyt Sherman Place. 
You may be aware that they just uh, finished a $4.5 million project where they added on a, a new portion of the building. It's the right-hand side section with the curved windows. All that is all brand new. Um, well, first and foremost and most important to the guests, there's more bathrooms. <laughs> Perennial complaint for those of you who attend concerts there. Um, there's a donor lounge, and then addition, there's better green room facilities. Uh, I, you know, we bring artists here all the time, and and uh, it's a great. I love this hall. It's a beautiful theater, but the backstage facilities were lacking, and so this is so great for the artists coming into Des Moines and experiencing a first class facility. Um, Next slide, please. The other thing that's going on, you may also be aware of, is the Franklin Junior, Franklin Junior High project. Uh, Jeff Young is the developer on this. This is a, the, a former junior high built in 1951 that was purchased by First Federated Church in 1980 to accommodate the growing congregation. Um, the church, uh, Frank, First Federated Church was growing so much that they added onto this building and the sanctuary is, is a 4,000 uh, seat sanctuary that's part of this facility. Um, th this is an $8 million project which will tr transform this whole campus, let's call it, into a multi-purpose venue, including six auditoriums ranging in size from 1, 100 seats to 4,000, which is the sanctuary, former sanctuary. Um, now, De De the developer Jeff Young is modeling th this uh, idea on, uh, th there's a company in the Pacific Northwest called McMenamins, McMenamins, and they have this uh, track record of turning to schools and other historic buildings and transforming them into something interesting, whether it's a brewery with a hotel or a winery with a hotel and restaurant. And that's Jeff's, Jeff's model here. And uh, we're pretty excited actually um, to be presenting some concerts there this fall. Next slide. Um, this is just a photograph showing you the current state of the uh, renovations of the big uh, uh, former sanctuary. It's going to be called the Benjamin Event Center. Um, its capacity is between 2,300 and 4,200, depending on how it's set up. Uh, we won't tend to use that space very much. Our audiences aren't quite that big. Next slide. But we will use this auditorium very, very frequently, and that's the Franklin Auditorium. It was the original junior high auditorium. Um, it's right sized, it's 550 seats, really right sized for a lot of our concerts. Um, you know, all, all told, if you look back through what I've just presented to you um, in terms of capacity, uh, these new these projects will pr offer significant new additional capacity, including including 35,000 seats outdoors, 8,000 seats indoor outdoor, and about 5,000 seats here. Um, so it, we're, we're this is there's an explosion of of uh, facility of infrastructure for uh, us to present concerts and for people in Central Iowa to experience them. Next slide. Also worth I need to mention in this context is the activity that's gone on recently in cl clubs. Um, the Woolies, I don't know if you've ever attended Woolies, but it's a great facility. It was opened in 2012 by Sam Summers, uh, the pro, uh, one of the promoters in Des Moines. Uh, it has a capacity of 700 people. It, it's mostly a, a rock and pop concert venue, uh, but they do other things there. Um, maybe you, you might have attended some concerts there, Doug. <laughs> He's a heavy metal fan I've discovered this morning. Um, but you know the, the the young people that attend these mostly young people. I also attend concerts there, and, and uh, but it's 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 a part of the reason that young people want to stick come to Des Moines and stay here is Woolies. And another venue that's important is the next slide, and that is Noche. If you, if you've not been to Noche, even if you not you don't consider yourself a jazz fan, you should try and go. It's on Walnut Street downtown, opened by Max Wellman. Uh, co-owner. Co it's an important presence in Des Moines. Um, it's, we're very lucky to have a jazz club in a metro this size that's active like this. Um, it has excellent sound, a real handsome room, nice bar, and really important is it gives local musicians a chance to perform. And if I can say anything about uh, the activity that I just described uh, in terms of facilities and, and kind of uh, infrastructure for concerts, that's, that's really a great commitment here. But the next piece of the puzzle is to provide more opportunities for local musicians to perform. Um, that will help uh, kind of create a, a, an, an economy of scale for, for, for people to choose to be active professional musicians in Des Moines, which is going to be good for us. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> another place that you should know about if you don't already is XBK. This is a new club that opened um, just, just before COVID hit. Um, it, it, it's in the Drake neighborhood. It's at 24th Street in, in the Drake neighborhood. It's a 250-seat capacity venue co-founded by Toby Parks and uh, Tom Kutz. XBK stands for X brooklyn Kid. Clever. Uh, Toby's from Brooklyn. Uh, it focuses on cutting edge and alternative music and on giving a place for local musicians to perform. 
And like Woolies draws a younger crowd. Next slide. I'll breeze through this pretty quickly. Also important to keep in mind as you're thinking about what's going on in the music scene in Des Moines is the number of festivals. Starting with 8035 in 2008, that's when I moved here to Des Moines. They burst onto the scene and the people, they 8035 proved that Des Moines could support a, what is now kind of a you know Lollapalooza model, big music festival and draw young people to Des Moines and it's been successful ever since. Um, two other festivals, that, this isn't by, by no means, the, the, it's not a full list, but Hinterland, a more recent uh, introduction into the central Iowa festival scene that is, takes place in St. Charles. And then the Zenith Chamber Music Festival uh, put on by S Ashley Sedan of Drake. You know, there's just this, um, these festivals are a sign of commitment and investment in music, just like those facilities are that I described. Next slide. Also worth mentioning, of course, is the, the things that are going on at Jasper Winery every every Thursday night, I think, in the summer. That's the top slide. Or at the two, um, there's the Est Simon Estes and Brenton Skating Plaza. Those are active uh, festival sp music. It's not, not a festival per se, but it's regular concerts organized by Sam Summers. Um, next slide. So th that's all a description of what was going on through 2019. And then something happened, right? I have the date of March 14th on the screen right now because that's the date when it got real for me, that we had something serious to deal with. You probably all had some date around there when it became real for you. And the reason it became for real for me that this was serious and it was going to change everything was I had tickets for the symphony's performance of Carmina Burana that night. And um, it's a big production with a large orchestra, three choirs, three vocal vocalists. I was so excited and I drove the bridge on Locust Street and parked, and boy, it was easy to get a parking spot. And I walked down the street, and there, there aren't musicians walking into the building, and I got to the Civic Center, and it was dark, and there was a sign that said the concert had been canceled, and I guess I apparently missed the email. And that was like, oh my, the symphony has canceled a concert. This is, this is serious. We've been, we've been, of course, talking about it as an organization, but it got real that night for me. Next slide. You know, the word of the year for 2020 will probably be pivot, right? Um, I, it, it, the definition is the, the action in, in basketball of stepping with one foot while keeping the other foot on its point of contact with the floor. So civic music like uh, musicians, like uh, venues, like everybody who's in the live music scene had to figure out how to pivot, how to keep their foot on the ground, which is how to keep doing what they were, you know, how, keep delivering the things they were delivering but in a new way by moving that foot around. Um, we chose, uh, like others, to start live streaming concerts. Um, our mission is to support our artists by giving them a chance to perform and to give our audiences a chance to listen. So we went right at live streaming. Next slide, please. Uh, I didn't know a thing about live streaming in March of 2020. Um, so I watched a lot of YouTube videos about how to do it. I engaged with artists who were uh, more experienced than me and who could help make it happen. Um, Organizations like NPR with their Tiny Desk concerts had a, had a head start. They started doing uh, Tiny Desk home concerts f really fast. Um, but, we, you know, we, we had to, uh, they, so they had an easier time of it. But it's been a challenge for everybody. Next slide. So I'll just quickly go through what we did this summer. Starting uh, uh, in April, so one month after that, for that big date for me, we had launched uh, Get Music, Get Happy Hour, which was a, every Friday, 5.30, live stream concert from an artist's home. And uh, we did uh, 15 of them from April 17th to uh, July 24th. These were free. We paid the artists. Um, we, they had to stream for us uh, to our Facebook page and our YouTube pages. Uh, we started with Emmett Cohen, who's in the upper right there, the great jazz pianist from his home in, in, uh, in uh, Harlem. Uh, we broadcast uh, chamber music from people's homes. We broadcast uh, Keanu Linnell, the woman in the lower left. This is out in the backyard of her home in Baton Rouge. Um, we, you know, we, we saw Real uh, people were so grateful for this, um, and both the artists and the audience, and they were just like, "Thank goodness, something to look forward to at the end of another, an, at the end of a tough week." Um, we did receive donations. We solicited donations that helped support this, but it, you know, we did it for free. Next slide. Um, the Bell and Quartet. We moved them online as well. Uh, they went to Wednesday nights at 5:30. Uh, happily, we found a great partner in uh, Applied Art and Technology. Kudos to Applied Art and Technology. If anybody is involved with that organization, that company, they they uh, inkinded their studio and uh, the staff and equipment to broadcast the Bell and Quartet from from Applied Art uh, for uh, 10 weeks running, and. Um, 
real professional. We, we looked great, and, and thanks to them. Um, Next slide. Um, we also continued doing music education this summer. Uh, we had a summer session with a music educator, uh, uh, Joyce Beyer, giving lessons that were focused on the music the Bell and Quartet was playing each week. And kids could watch that and then watch the concert and learn something about it. Next slide, please. Um, so that took us through July. And then we um, decided that we would explore monetizing. And that's the big, the big question is, can we monetize this, right? So um, we had two concerts that were originally scheduled for a 1920 season that hadn't happened yet, and we, had, we got them scheduled for August. And the people who had tickets for those live concerts got to check in for free and watch uh, Emmett Cohen uh, live from Birdland. Uh, that was kind of fun. We got to make it, make that happen. Uh, and then uh, Anderson Row Piano Duo, they, they were in actually, in, one was in LA and one was in New York, and it was being fed to to Portland for a piano festival that we partnered with to get that concert underway. Um, it was a good experience for the folks who um, who were there. They, they, it was high quality, uh, much more high quality than we were able to pull off with our Get Music, Get Happy Hour stuff. And um, so we, with that in mind, next slide please, we decided to continue uh, offering live stream, high quality live stream uh, concerts with a new series this fall called Play On. Um, it's from a quote from Shakespeare, if music be the food of love, play on. So that's, how, that's what we're calling it. And we're kind of uh, knowing that people like the idea that it was uh, that Emmett Cohen, for example, was performing at Birdland. And they couldn't go there. Maybe they'd never been there. And so we're following that model for this new series where we're, uh, artists are performing um, in interesting locations around the country. Next slide. All right. But ultimately, live streaming, no matter if we're able to draw an audience and charge a nominal fee, our play on is 15 bucks if you want to watch that con any of those concerts. That's really not sustainable. Uh, eventually, we'll have to return to the concert hall and, or to the club, eventually. But when, that's the big question, right? So in September, Live Nation's CEO, M Michael Rapino, assured investors that concerts will return in summer or fall of 21. And we're planning on returning to uh, Hoyt Sherman Place and to Franklin Junior High next fall. Hope it can happen. Uh, a recent survey of uh, industry professionals, you're seeing a, 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 one of the charts from that survey was split on the question of when we can expect to return to full capacity with 30% um, saying not until 2022. I hope they're wrong. I hope the 25% the 20, that say quarter three are right. Wouldn't that be nice to be able to go back to a live concert in, in, in like next fall? Or, in nor or if you're a football fan, go to a normal game. Next, next uh, slide, please. Um, however, an interim step that I'm, we're pursuing is outdoor concerts. And I think that'll be the, the, the norm, at least through the summer months. They're doing it, of course, in LA and other more fair weathered places right now. But I think that's what's gonna happen with, uh, with us and with a lot of performing arts organizations. We're gonna try to make the most of our outdoor spaces and happily we have the capacity to do it. So look for that. Uh, I like this slide on the, the picture on the left with the circles, you know. That's probably what we'll, we'll be doing this, this spring with our, if we have things on the lawn. Next slide. Okay, so that's the situation, you know, we're, we're, we're it's not sustainable what we're doing. Artists are struggling, they don't, you know, the, the artists, the musicians are in the worst place. They're gig people, so they're not getting gigs. We're giving them a little bit of work, but um, the things that you can do to help. Um, tune into live stream concerts, whether it's put on by an artist or by us. Uh, even if, like our Play On series, there's a $15 fee. Just, it's not much, right? So it's just, uh, I know people, I think, are getting a little tired of it, but if you can stick with it and, and attend virtual concerts, know that that matters, no matter, no matter what. Um, you can support the recently formed National Independent Venues Association and their Save Our Stages uh, campaign. They're trying to get, convince Congress to include support for venues in the next round of relief. Um, it, it, you know, Vaudeville Muse and Green Mill have closed so far in Iowa. Two, you know, long standing, especially Green Mill, it's been around for decades. And uh, the, the person who runs the uh, National Independent Venues Association predicts that over half of the venues will close if there isn't something done to help. So those small venues like XPK and like Noche and like, you know, even Hoyt Sherman is an independent venue, they, they make things happen. Um, you can also support musicians by donating to, uh, uh, the, there's many foundations that have either pre-existed COVID but, or have emerged since. The Jazz Foundation of America's COVID-19 fund is one place you can turn to. Um, and finally, uh, if venues like Noche 
uh, are offering live music experiences, and they are right now, 25% um, capacity. So you can uh, capacity of 40 in a 160 seat hall. And you're comfortable with going, please attend. And when CMA starts offering live in-person concerts next fall, please consider buying a ticket. Thank you. <laughs> next. Any questions? <laughs> Hi, Peter Skeet Wood. It's good to see you. Nice to see you. How you been? Good. Good. Um, civic music um, has been a has been a great source of, of pride for Des Moines for a long time. Um, is the do you have the financial footings to last through this? Um, are you, I know you're still continuing your fundraising and whatnot, yeah. but um, you know, do you have the resources? Is there an endowment fund that uh, is helping to sustain you now or not? We're fortunate in that we do have a, for the size of our organization, I should say that I, I'm the only full-time staff and I have a half-time staff person supporting me. So it's pretty bare bones in terms of administration. With the reduced cost of uh, that we're paying for our productions, being, we're not paying venue costs. We're not flying artists to Des Moines. We're not, you know, marketing budget's been reduced. We're able to kind of control costs um, right now. We, we, even though we're small, we do have a reasonable endowment, and we haven't ha had to make any kind of a turn toward the endowment yet, and I don't think we're going to have to, uh, but we can't sustain it more than this fiscal year. We're going to, you know, if, if people uh, continue to give as, in the way that they have in past years, which they are, um, we'll do okay, but I, it, it can't last more than another six to nine months, and then we'll start running into trouble. And that, you know, every organization is different. That's ours. Uh, some, you know, some places that are more uh, kind of fan, hand to mouth, we'll, we'll have already closed or will soon. My name is Dave Dixon, and uh, I moved to Des Moines area about four years ago, and somewhere I read or heard about the different venues cooperating together to come up with what was were reasonable sized venues without going into hyper competition and cutting each other's throats. And I wondered if you could tell us what that is and how that works. Well, one of my favorite words right now is collaboration and partnership, or two words, collaboration and partnership, and that's going to be what uh, keeps us going, frankly. And I, thanks for bringing that up. I meant to mention it. I didn't put it in my notes. Um, <clears throat> that, you know, we are, uh, we, we were, we're partnering with the Ballet Des Moines on a project this fall. We're going to bring a recording of Peter and the Wolf, where the dancers are dancing and our Bell, Bell and Quartet's playing, and IOPBS is recording it and going to broadcast it. It's those kinds of ways of working together to amp, kind of leverage each other's abilities and, and, and tap each other's audiences is what it's going to take. Um, but this, th there's certain balkanization, definitely, in our music community and, uh, and performing arts in Des Moines. And uh, we just need to you know, agree that it, it, there's more value in working together than not. And um, you know it's it's just going to take probably a small group of organizations that are convinced of that to come together and to you know make some uh, plans for collaborating on a kind of a long term basis. Right now, it's kind of uh, as projects uh, arrive and we're able to kind of take advantage of them. It's um, less of a kind of a uh, it's more individual organizations seeing something and saying, oh, I could do that with this organization, and they come together and those things do happen but thinking more holistically and systemically in Des Moines about it would be very good. Thank you, Peter, for being with our club today and giving us your informative presentation. And we are donating the book, While We Can't Hug, 
We're going to donate that to the downtown school library in your honor, and I know you've uh, autographed it and given the young readers some encouragement in there. And one question for the uh, program committee. So our speaker today is a Fulbright scholar. Where do you keep finding all of these people that are so much smarter than me? I was waiting for somebody to say, well, it doesn't really take that much, but <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead and fill it in. I know many of you were thinking that, weren't you? Yeah, I see a lot of heads nodding. Thank you for being with us today, everyone here at Wakanda in person and those out there on uh, our live streaming and at a later time on our YouTube channel. For those of you watching on YouTube today, there are 29 of us here in the room today, all safely distanced. We'd hope more of you would consider showing up here in person at Wakanda. That is, if you are comfortable with doing such. RSVPs are due on Tuesdays. You can sign up with the uh, email that goes out on Fridays with the link or on the uh, Tuesday uh, email newsletter. Upcoming speakers. November 12th, we have our own multi-talented Claudia Schabel owner of Shabel Solutions. Her topic, moving from a statement to actions that support social justice and inclusivity. That's a tough word for me to say. November 19th, one of my favorite meetings of the year, the Police and Fire Awards. And on November 26th, Happy Thanksgiving. We're not meeting. So everyone enjoy time with your uh, family and friends and hopefully safely. Thank everyone for being here in person today with us or watching out there in cyberspace. And again, my motto of the year, leave something behind. Hopefully this week, if you see a veteran or speak with them, thank them for their service. And for those of you out there watching live, we thank you for your service if you're a veteran. With that, we are adjourned. <laughs>